our hope, folks, completely. If the Lord be not risen from the dead, you're yet in your sins, and Christ be not risen, then we're dead, and we have no hope, and all you have is what the world offers, death. That's all they have. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 3 with me tonight, please. Chapter 3, verse 13, one hand, and then John 1, 18 in the other. Chapter number 1 and verse 18 in the other. <clears throat> and John chapter number 3 and verse number 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. All right, now look at John 1, 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Father, bless the book now, and bless your word, and may it go forth for the purpose that you intend it. Father, I take my place tonight as the messenger. That's all I am. Let the Holy Spirit be the one who opens the heart and gives light to the soul. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, these are quite remarkable statements. I remember when I first got saved and started reading the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is the one we normally tell young people or new believers to read. And uh, that's good. And when they read the Gospel of John, when I read it, I came upon verse 13, chapter 3. And it says, The Son of Man which is in heaven... So I pulled down some commentaries to try to understand that because the text here in John chapter number 3 and verse number 13, who's doing the talking? Who's talking? Christ is. See the red? All right. Christ is doing the talking. And notice what he says of himself. He's here on this earth. He's speaking. And he says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven... In John chapter number, I mean, uh, Romans chapter number 10, we understand what that ascension means. That's part of your salvation. But now look at this. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now, is that a riddle wrapped up in an enigma and hard to be understood? Or does it hold for us tonight some great thing that might open our soul and our spirit and begin to show us the great wisdom and the might of Almighty God. When I get to something like this, I want to, I want to know. So I pray and I ask the Lord to show me. Because when He does, uh, He gives me an understanding that I can build upon. You can't build on shifting sand. If you get wrong doctrine, you'll never be able to build on it. But a lot of people have wrong doctrine and they try to force the Bible then to comply with their doctrine. You ever seen anybody do that? You do it all the time. They, uh, they get hung up on one thing or one idea, uh, their denominational uh, catechism, and then they spend the rest of their lives forcing the Bible to support that wrong doctrine or catechism. So what does it do for them? It closes the book. And it's like coming to a dead end. It's like coming to a brick wall. They'll get no further. Now, I've told you before, the Spirit cannot be defined there's no way in this world we know the essence of a spirit. We have all kinds of typologies in the Bible. We certainly do. Wind, fire, and all of that. That's all great, but that's not the essence of a spirit. It simply is an idea of how he moves. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof. Canst not tell from whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit of God. All right? There's the Holy Ghost compared to wind. But the Holy Ghost is not wind. He's God. Now, what you just read here, the Lord Jesus says, I'm on this earth, but I'm also in heaven. Now, here's how a lot of them handle that. You get some of the commentaries, and they'll say, well, this is John the Apostle writing uh, late 70, 80, 90 A.D., and what he's doing is inserting something that has already happened and saying that Christ is speaking of his exaltation and glorification at the right hand of the Father is something that's going to take place. I don't buy that. I don't believe that. I've told you before, and I intend to keep telling you, give you an idea of some of the things that will help you in understanding the Bible. I've told you that the old commentaries are the good ones. 
I've told you there are some good things today, but the old ones, if you've got old commentaries, hold on to them. The old stuff is the good stuff. A fellow by the name of John Peter Lang in German is Johann Peter Lang. He was born in 1802 and he died in 1884. So you're looking at someone who lived in the 17th century. He lived a long time ago, all right? Passed on in 1884. And what he says about this, he has quite a comment. And I think it'd be good to, uh, to get a hold of what he says. He says that the same perfect knowledge of God, Christ claims for himself alone. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, and neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So the son is saying that I know the father and you don't really know me like you think you know me. But if you know me in salvation, you know me rightly. But there is far more to know about me. The truth is that you'll never know in this world. We'll see him as he is. Right. We look through a glass darkly. But what can we learn from this tonight that will help us here? Because we need help here. I hope you've been praying for the people in Nashville. My, my, my. One picture there of the, of the pastor of that church holding his little girl. And, of course, this is before she passed away, murdered at the hands of a, of a, 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 a murdering wild person. But in any event, we need understanding from the Scripture. This passage right here in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 27, Lang says, strongly proves the essential harmony of Christ of the synoptic gospels with the Christ of John. Now, synoptic gospel, how many of you know what that is? I've mentioned it to you a thousand times, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synopsis, one view. And then John is the one who's the uh, outlier. And some of them don't even consider John to be uh, canonical or inspired. But I do, and I believe John has a special place, and I believe John was written for a special purpose, and I believe the chronology of when it was written is very important because it fits into the early New Testament church. So the only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the Bible says, which is in the bosom of the Father. Now note what he said here in verse 13. The Scripture says in, in chapter number 1, and, and, uh, and, and verse number uh, 18, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So the Bible tells me that the Lord Jesus Christ was walking on this earth incarnate, God incarnate in flesh, and yet at the same time, he was in the bosom of the Father. And the bosom of the Father is literally the very heart and soul of Almighty God. Now, how could he do that? Well, his spirit was, not his body. When the Lord Jesus Christ was here on this earth 2,000 years ago, his body was the body of the God-man. And that's the answer to what the Scripture says, a body thou hast prepared for me. It was a prepared body where God would incarnate himself in body or in flesh. That's what the incarnation is about. When God became flesh, he did not create a body that he would use for a while, then cast it aside. The Bible says in Acts 20, verse 28, to, to, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. God has blood. And that blood, of course, was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So does this not speak to something that we need to understand tonight then? Let me give you this scenario. We've got five planets now that are about to align. How many's heard about this? They're making a big deal, meteorologists talking about these planets. I remember when I first came to Temple 46 years ago, there were some evangelists out there that were talking about the alignment of the planets and made a big deal about it, as if it was some kind of a sign of the coming of the Lord, the soon coming of the Lord. Well, that was 46 years ago. He didn't come. And uh, not too long ago, we had some here in the country talking about blood moons. And they made a big deal about blood moons. Well, what did that turn out to be? Nothing. And here's the problem. People buy stuff if it sounds spectacular or if it's out of the norm or if, you know, if it, if it, if it appeals to, to something of that nature. And it sells books and you make money. 
I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody tonight of doing this just to make money. But what I am saying is this. When John the Baptist showed up 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ said, this is Elijah if you'll receive him, didn't he? Remember that? We've gone through that many times. Oh, what's, what would that mean? That would be a fulfillment of Malachi where he said, I will send you Elijah the prophet before that great and terrible day of the Lord. In plainer words, he will be the fulfillment of the prophecy of Elijah, even though he's John the Baptist. It was a variable thing. Did it happen? No. They rejected and it did not happen, but it could have happened. The Lord Jesus said of the second coming, he said, no man knows the hour of the day. No man, not even the son. Do you know why? I believe this is why. I believe that it is a conditional thing. Now, only the father has it in his hands to call when his son comes back. Only the father. And so if you want to sell books, you can set dates and all of that. But my friend, the Bible tells you plainly that no man knows that date or that hour. So what it does, it judges the motive. It judges the purpose. Why am I up here teaching to you tonight? And expect to make money on this? Have no point in that. Have no desire. I'm a pastor. My responsibility until I'm taken from this world is to teach, preach this book, study, spend time in it, and let God speak to me so that I might be able to speak to you and let the Holy Ghost do his work. No, never charge a dime for anything. Don't intend to. Everything we've ever offered on the internet or through the radio ministry or anything else has always been free of charge. If you'd like to give a love offering, fine. But you get it. If you need it, you can have it. And that's the way it ought to be. But in any event, there's one thing about this that's important. And that is that it looks into something that we have to do some thinking about. Now, don't you look at this right here. John Albrecht Bingle. How many's ever heard of Mr. Bingle? If you get into the Bible, do some studies, you might. He was born in 1687. And he died in 1752. He was born in the 15th century. Think about that. That's a long time ago, right? Listen to what this man says. The bosom here is divine, paternal, fruitful, mild, sweet, spiritual. Men are said to be in the loins who are yet to be born. We read about that in the book of Hebrews. He was in the loins of his father about to be born. They are in the bosom who have been born. But listen to what Bengal says of Christ. He says the son was in the bosom of the father because he was never not born. What's that mean? That means as the second person of the Trinity, there was never a moment he began. See what I mean? That's what he's saying. He's saying in a different way, but that's what he's saying. In plain words, he's saying Christ is eternal. That's what he's saying. We come by J.W.'s house every time we come to church. They, are, they, far, they follow the teachings of uh, Judge Rutherford and the rest of them. That, and all in the world they are a modern day, uh, 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 I forget what they're called in the first century. They deny the deity of Christ. And Arian, that's what they are. Thank you. First century Arians. Arius taught that Christ was a created God. Well, this is what Rutherford picked up, and he teaches the same thing today. And they go out, they knock on your door, and they present to you a kingdom that's coming and tell you how good living should be and how the commandments of God are so important. And they hem haul this, they create this religion, say this, say this, say this, this, that, this, that, about morality and righteousness. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not the absolute point of everything to them. It is what you can do for Jehovah. And if you do it right, you can earn your way into the coming kingdom. That's what they're about. That's not what it's about in the Bible. The Bible is about the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll never exalt him until you know who he is. And you'll never know who he is until you open up this Bible and let it tell you who he is. He's not one of the prophets. He's not a way to heaven. He's not a road to God. He is not, uh, you know, he's not a great leader, a great, uh, uh, a great teacher. No, no, no. He's God Almighty, manifest in flesh. Nothing less. Nothing less. And while he was here upon this earth 2,000 years ago, 
there was, he, when he was walking among men here on this earth, God incarnate in flesh, he was still at the same time in the bosom of the Father. And man, that's quite a thought. And it also opens up for you what I've been trying to say about the Spirit. The Spirit is not limited to one location. We teach, they teach this in theology, it's 101. It's called the omnipresence of God. That's just a big word. Simply means he can be everywhere at the same time. And that's good because he certainly can be everywhere at the same time. And I don't have time to get off from Satan tonight, but Satan's a spirit being too, isn't he? The Bible said he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It said that in Job chapter 1. The Lord Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh and hath no part in me. But the Bible also says that he's the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. The Bible said that Satan hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine to them and they be saved. In plain words, Satan has blinded the eyes of every living human being on this earth that has rejected Christ. How can he do that if he can only be in one place at a time? He's a spirit. And he doesn't come under the laws of physics, of the flesh. He's a spirit being. Be careful, dear friend, what spirit you bring in here with you. Be careful what spirit you get attached to and let come into you. Be careful with the spirits. Try the spirits. Be discerning of the spirits. When you pray and some spirit wants to show up, and they like to show up in your prayer room, be careful. Be careful of voices that you hear. Be careful of a desire to have things that aren't clearly laid out in the Bible. Be careful because this spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience can come as an angel of light. He can masquerade as the Holy Ghost. A girl in the book of Acts had the spirit of Puthos, Python. And she said, these be the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. And the apostle looked at her and rebuked her and told her, buddy, he cast that devil out of her. I do not want an affirmation of who Christ is coming from hell. You know what I mean? When the Lord Jesus Christ went before Herod and Herod was going to mock him and make fun of him, the one that Pilate sent him to in the north, he stood before him and did you know what he said to him? Not a single word. Not one word. But to Pontius Pilate, he said, you have no power over me or no authority over me except God has given it to you. You see what I mean? You gotta be, that's a study in itself, which is quite a remarkable thing when you look at how Christ spoke to different people. Here's a big mistake we all make. We want to paint with a broad brush. We want to put everything in its rightful box. We want to make everything simple. We want to make the Bible simple. The Bible's not simple. You can't paint with a broad brush. You got to leave it up to the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us. And so he said he's seated in heaven. My, that's quite a thing, don't you think? Yeah. Mr. Bingle, when you start studying the Bible, you'll find him quoted all the time by, uh, by, by, by commentators and so forth. And because they have the greatest respect for him. In Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 30, it says this, Then I was near him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Who's the I? It's the Logos. It is the Word. You know what it says in John 1, the beginning was the Logos or the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word, you remember that? The word, the spoken word, the written word, the living word, the word of God that you're here tonight hearing. What are you going to do with it? Some of you will turn a deaf ear to it because you're, you're, you know, you've got better things to do. Some of you for a while will listen to it and you may even think a while on it. But then sooner or later, something else will take its place. Or it may take a place, it may get a hold of your heart and begin to speak down into your soul. And first thing you know, it begins to have an effect on you and you can't get it out of your mind. And then you may open to the Bible and the word begins to lead you into more truth. And you may get on your knees and begin to pray and seek the face of God. First thing you know, things will begin to open up in the Bible about who God is and who you are and who Christ is. And then that word will bring forth fruit in due time. 
the word that I'm giving to you. It's not the messenger that gives the word. It's the word itself. That's what I could put a, a, a recording device up here and let it play it for you. And it would have the same effect. The word's the word. Even if it comes out of a machine. It's important. Because he said his word was in my heart and before me and it was my delight. You see, before the Lord Jesus Christ was incarnate in flesh, he, the Son of God, had already in the Father established the purpose of God in creating man and the, and the, and the ultimate goal in what this is all about. What it's all about. And men who are, who are so proud of themselves think that they're going to come into this world and they're going to turn it upside down and change everything and turn it right. And folks, let me ask you a question here tonight. Where's America right now? Hmm? 50 years ago, where was America? What's the church been doing for 50 years? Really? See? I was getting drunk until 1973. I lived my own life. Then in 1973, I met God. Amen. He found me. Then he called me. But I know how people are. We had a Christian school for five years here at Temple, 1979 all the way to 84. Five years we had Christian school. We had, well, these kids learned a lot. We had a good little school. Back when we had our school, an awful lot of the churches out here didn't see any need whatsoever in Christian schools. Saw no need at all in it. Back then, they saw no need in it. I wonder who they were voting for when they went to the polls. I wonder how much salt of the earth and light of the world they've been. You ever thought about that? There's nothing greater that a church can do than to be light and salt. Amen. To reach out to people, to give them something. Did you know that most people pass the church off as just a bunch of religious nuts? Over here on what's called the Strip, the Strip here at UT, uh, some of the men went over there 30 years ago, handed tracts out. They handed, one, they handed a tract to one of the students at UT. The student took the tract and said to the one that gave him the tract, have you read this? Have you read this tract you're handing me? And the guy was honest, he said no. threw it down right in front of him. In plain words, you don't have any idea what you're doing because you don't even know what you're giving out. You're just exactly what I always thought you were. You're just a bunch of ignoramuses that happen to be religious. They have no respect for us. That's where we are now because the church has never had a real light to follow, a real spirit and power and prayer and a purpose it's just always been from one feel-good meeting to the next feel-good meeting to the next meeting here to the next meeting here. I like his singing. He's pretty. This one over here and this one here and this one here and this one here. And they just move and move and move and move and move and nothing comes of it. All right, I chased my rabbits. I feel good about it now. Amen. <laughs> Caught one or two of them. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> get, get back in the text. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> the, uh, according to Hoffman and Meyer, the evangelist, this is John who wrote the gospel of John. He's called the evangelist. They compare him to John the Baptist. What's the big difference between John the Baptist and John the apostle? The biggest difference. Well, John the apostle was one of the 12. He was one of the 12. And not only that, he could write scripture. And John received direct revelation from Christ, all right? He was John, the apostle, the beloved of the Lord. And John the Baptist, he ate locust and wild honey. He, 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 he lived in the wilderness. And nobody would expect John the Baptist to really be what you'd call educated. So here's what scholars do. They say, well, you know, John the Baptist could never have said that. It had to be the evangelist that said that. And so when you get over here to... Uh, to Hoffman and Meyer, they say the evangelist is speaking here and speaking of Christ exalted, so forth and so on. 
And Mr. Lang answers him and says, but this would deprive the clause of all force and reduce it to a pointless self-neutralizing announcement if it means the only begotten son who has now ascended to the bosom of the father who once preached to us when he was with us. See what they're doing? It's in the future speaking about something in the past. All right. And this changes the meaning entirely because if that be true, there's no way that Christ could be on this earth and in the bosom of the Father at the same time. And you'd be surprised at how many people that go to church and how many preachers that are in the pulpit that do not believe for a moment that Christ could be on this earth and in the bosom of the Father at the same time. But I do. I had some people sit down in the office and told me how that they had things flashing in their house. They saw, saw things materializing. They were having, they, what they were having was a, was a battle with, with, uh, with demonic uh, powers. You don't, you don't make fun of it. If you want to know, folks, if you really want to know anything about demons, get a hold of Brother Randy Pike's book. And he spent, uh, he spent decades in South Africa and Australia, and he was there firsthand, right smack in the middle of it. And he has some harrowing experiences to tell you about when it comes to demonology, demon possession. I think you saw some of that just a few days ago. When you start shooting little nine-year-old children, you got evil. That's evil. That's evil. That's evil. Don't ever let anybody get up and tell you that all sin is the same. No, it's not. First John says there is a sin unto death. The Bible says there is an unpardonable sin. Amen. No, 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 no. They all originate from the same place. Sure they do, but they're not all the same. So to murder a little nine-year-old child, to shoot a nine-year-old child, there's got to be a spirit involved in it. But anyway, I talked to these people and prayed with them. I told them what to do. I said, speak to this thing. It's an intelligent being. Make sure you're right with God. Look at it eyeball to eyeball and tell it to get out of your house. And in the name of Jesus Christ, plead the blood against it. Come against it face on. Let it know that it's not going to run your life. It's not going to run you off. Speak to it. Speak directly to it. But you know what they told me? They said, well, we went to our church about this. And they just kind of passed it off and said, well, we'll pray for you. In other words, we'll not humor you. We'll not patronize you. We'll not buy into this. There is no such thing as demon possession. The Lord Jesus must have been crazy. Because he dealt with them, didn't he? But this is, this is religious arrogance, folks. And this stuff is standing in the pulpits of independent fundamental Baptist churches. Religious arro arrogance. There are demons. You ever get one after you, you'll know it. If one ever enters into your life and starts causing you problems, you're going to know it. And pray about it, but confront it. The only way to really deal with an evil spirit is to come face on. And plead the blood of Christ and command it in the name of Jesus. That's what they did in the New Testament. And it has to go if you know the Lord. So here's some of the things, and I'll come to a close with this t this evening, that I think, are, I think these are the kind of things that will uh, just make you think. That's what I want you to do. Uh, we have what's called an antithesis. antithesis. In other words, a thesis is a statement, it's a doctrine, it's a purpose, it's a message. You write a thesis on, on something. Antithesis or antithesis means it is against that thesis. It's something with an opposing view. So when you find in the Bible a statement by the Lord, and then here's a statement right here on the other side, and they seem to clash right in the middle. This is where you begin to learn things in the Bible. Watch this. In John chapter 1, verse 51, he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. All right. But then in John chapter number 3 and verse number 13, he said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now that appears to be a conflict. But do you remember what I said to you? There's no conflict in the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ is seated in the bosom of the Father, and he's also on this earth. There are statements that relate where, when, who. Always ask those questions, and you'll, 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 you'll never get into a situation where you're conflicting the Bible. Because believe me, Satan is the author of confusion. 
And if he can make something like that begin to build inside you, he'll get a stronghold. And when he gets a stronghold, he'll take forth from that stronghold and begin to destroy your life. Once you lose your faith in God's word, folks, once you lose it, I don't care what else you believe, it's going down the tubes. We are people of the book. What I believe about Christ is strictly from the Bible. Now, I want you to notice in John 8, 35, it says, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. See that? John 8, 35. But then in John 14, verse 9, he saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? What did he say? He said this. He said, I do abide, I'm there. But if you see me on this earth, you've also seen the Father. There's a mystery to that, but that's what he said. Do I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is the Father? I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And nobody, and don't ever let anybody try to hem haul you, nobody is going to lay under a microscope and lay out the essence of the Godhead because they can't even do the Father being a spirit being. John chapter number 10, verse number 30. I and my Father are one. All right, in John 16, verse 28, he said, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. Now, wait a minute, he said, I'm one with the Father and yet I came forth from the Father. See this? Well, how would that work, preacher? Well, he's one with the Father in the sense that there's the Godhead. Okay, but it came forth from the Father because I am the God-man. And we have to understand who the God-man is. When Christ died on the cross, ask yourself this question when he died. The scripture says in the book of Acts 1, he, 2, he would not leave his soul in hell. The Bible said in Isaiah chapter 53, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. So what happened to the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ? He left his body. Where did it go? He went down to the heart of the earth. What happened to his body? His body died. What happened to his spirit? His spirit went back to God who gave it, right? In his case, the spirit that Christ walked in this earth with and breathed was the spirit of almighty God. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Yes, that's important. Study the Bible and you'll find life in two ways. You'll find everything that exists, everything, tell you what it is, where it is. Its life came from God. From God. If something could, if something exists that lives, is a living thing, apart from God, then my goodness, friend, God is not almighty and he is not the creator, the almighty creator. There are things out there that existed before, right? But that's not the case. They're looking, they're trying, they're hunting. They want to find life so bad they can't stand it. But they can't do it. So there's life from God. That's the creation, the life of the creation. But the life of God, the life of God, is what the Lord Jesus Christ said, And Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. A soul came into being when Christ was born on this earth. That soul came into being exactly as the soul of Adam. Do you remember when Adam's body was created from the dirt? What happened? God breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, right? And then what did he become? He became a soul, a living soul, right? Two parts spiritual entities, one part flesh. He became a living soul. But in Adam's case, his life came from God. He did not have the life of God. If you remember when he went to that tree, God put a cherubim with a flaming sword and said, I'll keep the way to the tree of life lest he eat of this thing and live forever. Which, my goodness gracious, ought to make you go home and start scratching your head and saying, what in the world kind of life would that be if he could eat it and live forever? Don't, that, don't you think that's something? It's not so easy, is it? 
but God spared him from it. Because of the character and grace of God, he would not let that physical human being suffer that forever. That's right, because it says it plainly, forever. God would not allow it to happen. He wouldn't allow it to happen. So his life went back. But in the case of Christ, the spirit of Christ that went back to the Father was the life of God. When God saved you, whenever that was, whenever you asked the Lord to come into your heart, you believed on the Lord Jesus. You received him. You literally received the life of God. And you will live forever. It can't be taken from you. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. They're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He said, no man can pluck them from my hand. And they can't pluck them from my Father's hand. But I had an Armenian tell me one time. Uh, he said, yeah, but you can pluck yourself out. It's just like a, 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 a Campbellite said one time, well, I'm going to tell you something right now. What makes you think that thief didn't come down off of that cross and get baptized and go back up on that cross? Because he thinks you have to be baptized to be saved. You see, the thief on the cross settles a lot of issues. He really does. He really does. He really does. That salvation is as simple as it comes. And on it goes. Here's the good one. And I'll close with this one tonight. Look at John 1, 14. John chapter 1 and verse number 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, there's that glory. But look at John 7, verse 39. John 7, 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet what? But John said we beheld his glory. Yet the Bible says that he wasn't yet glorified. See, it's not a simple glory. It's not a simple glory. He had the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, as the God-man lived a sinless, perfect life. But then when he ascended by his own righteousness to the right hand of the Father, he was glorified in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And that was a glory that was earned. It was earned. Amen. His glory when he walked among us 2,000 years ago was innate. That's who he was. He was, that was that, his glory. That's who he was. That was part of his essence and his being. But he earned that right to sit down at the right hand of the Father and be glorified. God Almighty, praise his holy name, has an answer for questions you've never asked. There are places that we've never thought of. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things the Lord has in store for them that love him. The Bible said the Spirit hath revealed these things to us, yea, the hidden deep things of God. I'm glad that God can always keep you in suspense and keep me in suspense. I don't have it all figured out, folks. I don't tonight. I don't have an answer to every question. I don't have an answer to what happened in Nashville. What, what do you do? You love the people. You support them. You try to be there for them. You pray for them. And I know they've had a lot of support down there. I know a lot of people have been around there that love the Lord and, and try to support these people. That's a horrible thing. I can't imagine what that's like. Can you? I mean, what if you were ready to have funeral for your nine-year-old child? And then there's that, uh, then there was the, the janitor, that man, shot dead. And then the, the headmaster of the school, she was shot dead. And then a substitute teacher, shot dead. And they're, they're, somebody loves them. There's family. It belongs to somebody's family. And they'll be having funerals. They'll be having funerals. Amen. Father, bless your word tonight. I pray if nothing else, Lord, I've, in some small way, I've helped people begin to look up, look up, look up and realize, my Father, that nothing has ever or ever will happen that you don't know completely. It is of you, through you, and by you, and, re and, return, and returns to you. And Father, I pray now in Jesus' name, make yourself known among us. Help us tonight. We need help. God, how we need help. In thy holy name I pray, amen.